Good morning, everyone. So yeah, I'm Valerie Pascarella. I'm with Boston University. I also work out at the Harvard Forest, which is associated with Harvard University. It's their experimental forest about an hour and a half outside the city of Boston. And I'm currently a visiting researcher at Google. And so today we are going to be talking about mapping Earth's dynamic landscapes. And I'm going to be covering a pretty broad introduction to time series analysis for remote sensing applications. Um, unfortunately, when I have my screen up, I can't see all of y'all. So if you need me to stop or um, if we have questions, uh, please feel free to turn on a mic or uh, give a shout and I'll do my best uh, to to keep this interactive. Um, the slides are also available. Uh, there's a short link down in the corner. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. Um, and that QR code will take you to the same thing. So it's bit.ly 3SQZDQQ um, is the short link. And there's links and things embedded in this presentation. So it might be helpful to access that. So. Let's get Valerie, started. If, yes. Valerie, if you want, you can paste the link to your presentation in the chat. Ah, that's a great suggestion. Thank you. And so people online can already access it and I can share it in the Telegram group. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Yeah. And please, if anything's going awry, you can't access things, yeah, give me a shout. Thanks. All right. So I want to start with a quote that I really like when I'm thinking about remote sensing data. And I know you've already had a whole day of remote sensing. You've been talking about analysis ready data, saying R and integrating with the cloud. I saw there was a talk on monitoring vegetation. So I don't want to take us too far back. Uh, but Sir William Bragg in his uh, The Universe of Light uh, said that light brings us news of the universe coming to us from the sun and the stars. It tells us of their existence, their positions, their movements, their constitutions, and many other matters of interest. Coming to us from the objects that surround us more nearly, it enables us to see our way about the world. We enjoy the forms and colors it reveals. We use it in the exchange of information and thought. And when I think about remote sensing data, this is very much uh, in line with what I think of in terms of imagery, like we're getting information about the surface, about what's on the earth. And uh, when we use that in a temporal context, we can start to use that to monitor how our world around us is changing. And it's interesting, um, I saw there's some talks on hyperspectral. Uh, Sir William Bragg actually and his son won a Nobel Prize for their work on X-rays. So not even the sort of light that we're thinking about, um, but if we're, Familiar with remote sensing data, this should be a fairly familiar graph. We've got the visible light spectrum here going out into the infrared, near infrared, and radar. Um, and today, uh, we're actually going to focus mostly Valerie, on... Yes. You're not sharing screen. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> no worries. It's early here. <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> no worries. We understand. Yeah, that makes it a lot easier if we can see the screen. All right. So I got a tab. Okay, it's appearing now, yeah. All right, so here's my quote Good. and our friend Sir William Bragg and his universe of light. So yeah, thinking about light as a way of exchanging information. Um, and like said we're probably, if you've had an introduction in remote sensing course before, pretty familiar with this chart. Um, and I want to jump right into just kind of a broad overview here. Um, lots of different sensors, right? So this is a figure, the most recent I could find showing the um, the US, the NASA, NASA um, Earth Science missions. So quite a few satellites, including some um, open access favorites, Landsat uh, 7, 8, and 9 currently in operation, um, and a whole lot of others in the mix. We also now have the Copernicus program, um, all of their satellites. So together, we now have more imagery than ever before. Um, and I, can, I would 
take a quick aside to say I can really appreciate this. When I first started working with remote sensing data, it was the year before the Landsat archive opened. So when I was taking my intro remote sensing courses, uh, I was working with a single image or a couple of images that my instructor had pur purchased for his own research. Um, and then just a year or two later, one of my class projects was using the entire uh, archive available to us uh, via the USGS. So there's been this big dramatic shift. I should also preface a lot of what I'm talking about today by saying that most of my work uh, to date has been with uh, sun synchronous polar orbiting optical instruments. So again, that's Landsat, Sentinel-2, some planet scope imagery, a little bit of MODIS, but when I think about remote sensing, I'm a little bit biased towards the optical, though I've done a bit more work with Sentinel-1 lately. I should also be clear about my geographic bias. Uh, my work, again, work out at the Harvard Forest in Massachusetts. So I am most familiar with temperate forest ecosystems, um, but I'm very excited to learn more about the sorts of ecosystems that y'all are interested in studying. So during the two sessions today, I have kind of three main objectives here. I'd like to spend some time exploring Earth observation time series. So the session's all about time series. We should start by getting ourselves familiar with what some of these time series look, look like, especially if you haven't really dug through full collections of imagery before. And Earth Engine makes this really, really easy for us. Um, and we're going to think about some of the processes that are of particular interest to you as you're shaping your research questions or if you've already got ongoing work in a particular location. Then we're going to get into a bit on temporal segmentation. Uh, so I've worked a lot with the land trender and CCDC or continuous change detection and classification algorithms. So I'd like to give an overview of what those algorithms do, some of the uh, pros and cons of each, and then we'll spend some time exploring uh, what the results of those algorithms look like. And uh, finally, we're going to think a bit about space first versus time first approaches to time series analysis. And I will uh, get into more of what I mean by that later, uh, but this will end up being a dive into uh, Google's new dynamic world data set, which is a first of its kind near real time land cover classification product. So lots more to unpack in all of those. Um, but I'm really hoping to make today's sessions interactive. Three, two, one and a half hour blocks is a long time to be sitting and kind of absorbed in slides and your own computers. So we're going to try and make this a bit more dynamic. Um, hopefully everyone has a laptop. If you don't have an Earth Engine account yet, that's totally okay. Um, Given the size of the group, most or everything we're doing today will be with Earth Engine apps. So there'll be links uh, in the slide deck to uh, these apps on the web that you can access and we'll be able to look at imagery <clears throat> and test algorithms without needing an account. But if you're interested in continuing with this sort of work, I uh, highly recommend getting signed up for Earth Engine and happy to answer any questions about that. Um, we are also going to be using a tool called Slido, which if you haven't used before, allows us to do some interactive polling and we'll give that a test in just a second. But uh, I find it helpful to have my phone handy uh, as well as my laptop, but you can do it on either. And uh, for those who are in the audience today and you can turn and chat with neighbors, maybe this is a little less important, but especially if you're working remotely uh, with us today, uh, I would highly suggest that everyone start up some sort of notes doc. So um, I like Jamboard. If you haven't used Jamboard before, it's an interactive whiteboarding tool uh, provided by Google. So I believe if you just Google Jamboard, uh, you should get that up. It's a little bit separate than Drive right now, but it's essentially a big white space that you can paste imagery into. You can add text, you can draw and circle and add shapes, kind of like a PowerPoint slide, but a little simpler. Um, um, or just a standard Google Doc will work as well. But you'll see in some of the hands-on portions, uh, I'll be asking you to kind of copy things over, take screenshots from the tool, make some notes. So having a space where you can do that uh, is very much recommended to kind of keep us all engaged. All sound good? All right, I can't see, so I'm going to assume no words uh, mean that we can continue on. Yes, yes. Well, All right. <laughs> nice. So um, 
said we're going to be using uh, this tool called Slido. So uh, let's just give it a try so that everyone is a little more familiar with how this works. So you can join our session for the day at slido.com, either on your phone or on your computer. You can also scan the QR code for quick access. And once you get to the main screen, you'll be asked for a meeting number, a login number, and it's this number. Uh, down here, so 4185260. And uh, when you join, you should hopefully see a screen that has our spring school time series analysis at the top and a little section for Q&A and polls. And so let's see, as I move on to our polling slide, um, I'd love to know where everyone's joining from today. So there's a little box there, yeah. And I'm guessing most folks, given the uh, proportions, are in the room. Um, but I'm curious where others who are joining remotely might be from. Very cool. So let's take a minute and just let people get responses in. Awesome. So this is Slido, and it's awesome to know we've got such a, a diverse geographic representation. I should say I'm joining from Mountain View, California, so I think might be furthest away in terms of time zones. Um, but I'm glad that we're all here. And again, hopefully Slido is going to help us make this a little more interactive. Oh, we still got responses coming in. Moving along, hopefully if you didn't get your answers in, uh, we can keep going with this one's a bit more of a serious question and this will kind of help me understand how to frame some of what we're working on today um my understanding is most of you are still students although i imagine we've got some other folks joining as well but um in this poll if you could tell me what your how you would describe your level of experience working with satellite imagery are you just curious and you haven't like know what it is you've seen a few pictures and you're just getting started here. Um, you're very curious. Have you maybe tried some image processing, messed around a little bit in Earth Engine, some other image processing software, but you wouldn't necessarily say you're very experienced. Um, proficient, like you've done a bunch of analysis, you've got a good base skill set, uh, or are you an expert? You've done a lot of this. And this should be a voting poll. So if you go, our active poll should have changed. And I'm going to give everybody about a minute. Um, I think this one's set. It's not going to show the results until I click. Uh, but I'm going to set a minute timer here. Give everybody a minute to get your answers in. All right. I see our numbers have stopped climbing. So Nice. So most of the folks are proficient, still getting a few in there. So we'll try and move at a pretty good pace through some of the more basic material um, and maybe spending a bit more time on advanced things. But good to know that folks have some prior experience that we're building on. Okay, so now that I know a little bit more about where y'all are and your background experience, let's get into the heart of what we're talking about today. So let's begin with our exploration of not just the temporal domain, but also the spectral and spatial domains. So told you, I'm mostly familiar with optical imagery, or at least that's most of what I've used in my previous work. What are the platforms that you've worked with, if you've worked with uh, any Earth observation data sets before? Nice. Landsat. First and big. <laughs> That is definitely a favorite. Like I said, it's the first uh, remote sensing data set that I ever worked with and certainly the one I use most uh, in my, my own research. Some active sensors in there. We've got Jedi, Sentinel-1, Alice Pulsar. Every time I ask this question of a crowd, I'm always amazed at the diversity of responses. People use such an array of sensors nowadays, and it's amazing, again, what we can do now that most of this data is available to us for free. And a lot of it being housed on Earth Engine makes it even easier to analyze. If you used to have to download all of this, it was a lot more challenging. So let folks finish up typing. Awesome. So big winners, perhaps unsurprisingly, Sentinel-2, Landsat, and MODIS. So fortunately for you, that's the ones I am, um, again, most uh, familiar with myself. And here we go. So if you're not as familiar, you've never done a direct comparison like this, um, 
we've got kind of a range of both spatial resolutions and temporal both frequency and cover uh, coverage um, across those three sensors. And so Sentinel-2 has the finest spatial resolution, 10 meters for the visible bands uh, with 20 meter for the near infrared and SWIR um, and some coarser resolution atmospheric sensing bands. Uh, it's one of the newest kids on the block though. So our Sentinel-2 record starts just in 2015. So only about seven years of data for the top of atmosphere. Um, collections and in earth engine their surface reflectance processed back to 2017 that's also what's hosted on ESA uh, their hub but uh, you could in theory for yourself uh, process any of the top of atmospheric uh, top of atmosphere imagery um, to surface reflectance and Sentinel is giving us about a two to five day revisit depending on whether you're closer to the equator or up by the poles and that's a 10 day cycle per sensor. Landsat, we're a little bit coarser resolution, 30 meters, sounds like a lot of people have worked with Landsat data before so I won't bully for this too much but um, Landsat's interesting at least to me in that it's not just uh, one sensor, one constellation, uh, uh, it is a series of different sensors, and so we have uh, the most commonly used in conjunction are Landsats 4 and 5, uh, Landsat 5 really being the mainstay of the the, um, the record there, it's actually the world record holder for the longest continuous Earth observation time series. Um, and that's the thematic mapper sensor. We've got Landsat 7, which is the enhanced thematic mapper, which came on in 1999, but had a scanline correction failure around uh, 2003. So we have these stripes in the data or missing data areas. And then more recently we have Landsat 8, uh, the operational land imager, is is the optical sensor there coming on in 2013 and Landsat 9 in 2021, which is uh, the same sensor as Landsat 8. So they're pretty much clones of each other. And they're giving us a uh, eight day revisit with two sensors, so 16 day per, and we have this much longer record than we do for the Sentinel-2 imagery. And then finally, MODIS, uh, which the record starts back in 2000. We've got Aqua and Terra, so AM and PM timing. Uh, we're getting global coverage in just one to two days, which is awesome if you're looking for high temporal frequency. Um, but MODIS pixels are quite coarse. So uh, the example I'm showing here is one of the 500 meter products. There are 250 meter bands as well. Um, but you can really see in this example, and I tried to actually center it on where I believe you are all joining from um, who are at the uh, agency today, but uh, you can really see the difference in spatial detail across those sensors. And so moving to how we look at these time series, um, here are some examples. So kind of paging through, we've got Sentinel, Landsat, and MODIS time series for one of the pixels in that little image chip that I just shared. Um, and here uh, you can see different patterns, processes, so we can see Landsat 9 has the sparsest record. Um, we've got some ups and downs from the seasonal phenology. We get some, uh, you know, vegetation cycling in there. This is a, a vegetated uh, pixel. I think it's in a forest nearby one of the buildings. Um, and you can really see both the difference in that temporal frequency and the coverage. And why does this matter when we're thinking about time series analysis? Uh, there's a great paper by Robert Kennedy et al, bringing an ecological view of change to Landsat-based remote sensing in frontiers in ecology and environment. Um, but there's this figure that illustrates, depending on how frequently you measure, will really dictate the types of processes you can detect. So back before remote sensing data was more freely available, we might have had, like I said, one or two images to compare. And so, here you could connect a line through two observations uh, if you're looking at a figure F. I'm not sure you can see my pointer here, but um, if you don't have enough measurements, you might have this really complicated trajectory, but you don't have enough sampling to really describe it well. And if we compare that to uh, figure G, where we have much 
higher frequency observations, we have a much better chance of describing these more complex forms. And up in those top panels, we can see all sorts of types of changes that might manifest. We can get decreasing trends and increasing trends. If you're thinking about monitoring vegetation, this could be long-term decline or uh, growth patterns. Uh, figure C there, abrupt changes. So think about when something's converted from forest to built or flooded to not flooded states. So this really uh, dramatic state shift. Figure D is more of a disturbance recovery. So perhaps we clear some vegetation and then a new community begins to grow back. And E is a cyclic pattern. I tend to think of these most as uh, seasonal cycles, but I've also seen uh, repeated patterns, like there's a great example of a tidal inlet in Massachusetts that moves across a beach. And every time it, uh, this little channel of water crosses the sand, you'll get this uh, periodic cycle and it's about a five year uh, time repeat. So we can see these sorts of patterns in lots of different ways. Um, and here again, a fairly local example, but um, this is a Sentinel-2 time series, and we've got a couple of different types of change. So we can see in the early part of this time series, we've got more of a uh, phenological cycle. We've got greens uh, in the um, summer getting a little bit browner, it looks like in the um, Winter months uh, for, I'm thinking Northern Hemisphere, so I've got to flip it for you. So we're green in the yeah, summer and brown in the fall and winter. And then suddenly um, around 20, like mid 2021, we get this much brighter tone. And so we see the phenology gets a lot higher. We get a, a stronger reflectance signal. Um, and then the following year, there's more of this abrupt break. Suddenly we go from being very dark green as is illustrated in the second to last image chip uh, to being cleared. And this to me looks like a, a field or some sort of um, forested vegetation that's being converted to something more open and then uh, more complete clearing later in the time series. And admittedly, this is an example I know personally. I usually work uh, in places where I can match ground-based observations to the remote sensing series, um, but hopefully that's what we can get into in the first part of the session today, where you visit some places you know well and we can look at the signals. And so going back to what we can do with different uh, repeat times and spatial grains, again, from that same paper, we can see um, these different sensors are kind of well suited to different types of processes. For example, if you're looking at agriculture, you may be okay with a wide range of spatial resolutions, but you really need a high revisit time, a high temporal frequency, because you need to characterize things like crop cycles. If you're dealing with urbanization, you may want a much finer spatial grain. You want to have tiny pixels so you can see buildings and individual developments going in. Um, but it might be okay if the revisit time isn't as frequent because we expect those changes to be more persistent. So. All of this to say that the type of change you're interested in is really gonna dictate the sensors that you use. And then finally, I've been kind of skipping the um, spectral part, but I saw there's a lot of hyperspectral later in your schedule. Um, the broadband sensors that we're gonna be exploring today, uh, Sentinel-2 and Landsat are fairly comparable. Um, MODIS, again, similar portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, but the big thing is that all of these sensors see more than meets our human eyes. And uh, depending on which bands you choose, you may also be able to detect different processes. For example, the shortwave infrared is more sensitive to vegetation structure. Near infrared is sensitive to vegetation quantity. And if you're all fairly proficient with imagery, I imagine I'm kind of repeating things you might already know. Last uh, thing I'll say on spectral, um, the tool that we're going to be using in the interactive portion gives you some options to change band combinations. If you may be less familiar with remote sensing imagery, here are three kind of standard combinations where we assign different bands from uh, the sensor to different channels. These combinations work across uh, MODIS, Landsat, and Sentinel-2. In fact, all of the uh, images and the time series I've shown have been in the false color SWIR composite 
this first one um, to the left here where we're assigning the uh, SWIR channels or the shortwave infrared to the red, the near infrared to green and red to the blue, which makes vegetation very, very green. And then urban is kind of a bluish purple color and drier, barer things are kind of mid uh, pinkish tones. Um, false color near, NIR is a common composite where the vegetation uh, shows up red in this case because the near infrared is assigned to the red channel, so really strong signal there gives us red vegetation and classic true color where the colors are mapped to their uh, standard channels. This is most akin to what we would see in the Earth base map uh, if you're familiar with Google Earth or what you see in a camera image, um, but a little bit less information content since those channels are all very correlated. So that was a lot of talking, uh, but I wanted to make sure that we all had enough background to explore this next part. And let me pop on over um, to this app. And you're welcome to open it up and let things load and follow along. I'm gonna do a quick demo, and then we're gonna take a bit of time for everyone to explore on their own. But what this tool is, um, I call it the Earth Observation Time Machine. Um, what's loading right now in this Earth Engine app is a composite of its Landsat 8 imagery, as noted by the sensor down here in this pull down. And so just to give us a view of what we're looking at for a given sensor, uh, we get the last, I believe it's six months if the sensor is currently in operation or if the sensor is no longer in operation, it's the first year of data. Details don't matter too much. The point is we're looking at a composite. So a lot of different images can mash together temporally um, so that we get a nice, relatively cloud-free pixel. But what's really cool about this tool, and how about we scroll down to closer to where y'all are, and I'm gonna admit I'm going to need the map to get us to the right place, but If we go here and let that load. Um, so we can actually interact with those band combinations that I was just mentioning. So here I'll change this and in real time, the colors and the composite will change. Um, you can adjust the stretches. So if you've ever worked in GIS software or in Earth Engine, you can set uh, the uh, like histogram stretching for different bands um, and that's great if we're looking to explore the spatial properties of imagery, but what this tool is most designed to do, and it's going to take a second to load here, but if you click a point, those charts that I was showing earlier were actually generated by this tool. And so here you're seeing the time series of Landsat Im imagery for this blue, pic uh, blue point that I just clicked. It is the pixel that intersects that point. And as I change the color combinations in the the um, tool here, what you will see in the chart points is the color of each individual point is the color of that observation in the image. And like I said, we're looking at a composite, so um, it's an aggregate at first, but if I go and click one of these points, I will actually get the image that corresponds to that date. So it's a pretty easy way to page through some imagery and look at kind of mapping between what am I seeing spectrally? So what is the color of that pixel? How does that color change through time? Um, and be able to kind of go back and forth between the uh, spatial, the temporal, and the spectral. And uh, all of the sensors that we've kind of been discussing so far are available. So um, I will warn the MODIS ones take a while to load. It's the daily image collection, so there's a lot in there. But if, for example, we wanted to look at Sentinel-2 instead of Landsat, we're going back to an RGB here, but I can easily change it to that SWIR composite again. So go back here. And hopefully in just a second, we'll have a time series. A couple more things to be aware of. There are often little points hiding up here that make uh, the axes a bit more stretched. So there's probably some phonology in here, kind of that green to brown cycling. Um, and if we use the little arrow to pop the chart out, it's often easier to see some of these patterns in more detail. 
And the last thing, I won't do this live so I won't mess up the images, but if you download the CSV, the tool will give you all of the reflectance values for that sensor for your clicked point. Um, and the latitude and longitude are recorded on the chart. So a great way if you wanted to kind of go back and reanalyze just a single pixel, it doesn't do more than that at this point, but great way to kind of get started looking at time series. So I'd like to take a little bit of time and let everyone um, look through uh, some places that they know well. I say about 15 minutes uh, would be good and I may change the tab so I can actually see you. Um, but if you go to the link to the tool, I can put that in the chat as well. Um, although I might have to, there we go. I can do it from here. So if we spend about 15 minutes, um, explore some places that you know well. So these were places I didn't necessarily know, but when I'm working in my own study area, I have lots of great examples of forests that have been cleared, new developments, um, places where I have a sense of the change. Click around, try some different sensors, and see if you can find some examples like the ones that I showed in that uh, abstract figure. Um, can you find some gradual changes, some abrupt changes, some cyclic changes? And this is where that Jamboard or doc uh, is coming in. If you um, if you're working along, take some screenshots, paste them into the doc with some notes, or add them to a Jamboard. Same thing. Make some notes about what you're seeing, uh, the lat longs, maybe what bands are best, what resolutions seem best suited for this process, um, and then in about 15 minutes we'll come back and uh, we can open it up for some discussion and maybe then some sharing out. And for those who are all in the same room together, uh, feel free to discuss with neighbors, share examples, like I want to keep this, uh, keep this interactive. So I will let everyone work and I'm also here. So if there are questions, feel free to also put them in the chat or uh, turn your mic on and just give a shot. Uh, some great questions in the chat and I'm gonna try and go back and forth between typing answers and talking out loud. But um, so the time series themselves have been masked to remove clouds and cloud shadows. So you're getting a pretty clean signal, especially with Sentinel-2, you'll often see a lot of cloudy noise. That's just we're using um, either the Sentu core uh, scene classification layer SCL um, for the surface reflectance data or the QA60 band for the top of atmosphere. And those can be a little noisy, so you'll see more cloudy data in Sentinel-2, um, and that's just a function of how good the cloud masks are. However, when you click the, the points and view an image, you will actually see the full image. There's no masking applied there. So if you're clicking a point, um, you're getting a clean time series. If you're looking at an image, you're able to see what's a cloud, what's a shadow, and it's a little bit more helpful. I think to actually get to see the clouds there. Um, and so a couple questions about the band that's on the y-axis. That is a great question. And so it's not a spectral index. And this was a, a intentional design choice in setting up this tool. Um, it is the spectral magnitude. So simply the vector length. If you were to take all of the bands that you're putting into the RGB and you take the square root of uh, each of those added together uh, or squared and added together. So it is literally the spectral distance, the spectral intensity, and it is the most akin to what you're seeing in the images themselves. So it's not NDVI, it's not any one band, it is the intensity across the three bands that you chose for the composite. And that means what, again, what you see in that image composite is what you're seeing in the, um, for like the color of the pixel is the color of the dot on the chart and it is the relative intensity compared to other um, other values uh, for that pixel through time. I know that's a little confusing so I can try and explain it again if that uh, isn't clear but it is really just the spectral magnitude. 
Yeah. And if you were interested in, say, NDVI, I would recommend putting near infrared and red as two of your bands. You'll get something that has some of the components of an NDVI. And if you wanted to calculate the NDVI, if you were to download the CSV that goes to that point, you would have all the spectral bands you'd need to do that. But I use this tool a lot when I'm first digging into time series, and I find this just a nice way to condense all of that information without having to make too many choices about um, what you're looking at index-wise. So many indices. All right, so hopefully everyone got to see a few interesting examples Again, great questions. I'm wondering if I see a couple of docs and Jamboards in the chat. Does anyone want to post in the chat and willing to share something that they found? Either Maria or Antonio or anyone else want to add? Antonio o María Soledad, si alguien le quiere activar el micrófono y compartir. Hola, soy Soledad. Hello, Valerie. Uh, I, I is my my first. Um, it's the first time I try to use the Google Earth Engine. I heard a lot about it, and when as you as you showed us. I think it's, it, ha, it has a lot of potential. I, I, I am really surprised. Uh, the, the example I shared is about um, a, a reservoir in northern Argentina in the, in the state of Tucumán. And it is called El Cadillal. Uh, the reservoir name is El Cadillal. And I wanted to see how uh, it changed through time. Uh, because uh, when I did my, my PhD research, I, I studied the, 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 the area, the contributing area to that reservoir, and we saw that uh, some land, land use changes and, could, um, and we could understand that land use changes were affecting the reservoir sedimentation. So that was what I wanted to see how uh, the, um, I don't know how to say the, um, the, the uh, the, tri the tributary river to the reservoir uh, is uh, is having a, a more a more divergent uh, um, design. So I wanted to see how how that changes uh, were appearing in, in the earth engine, uh, and I took a pixel and I uh, observed. Uh, how sometimes it is covered by water, sometimes it is covered by vegetation. Uh, that, that's what I tried to do <laughs> today. Nice. Could you either share the doc or even if you give me the um, longitude and latitude coordinates in the chat, maybe we can look at it. I'm just getting an access denied on the doc. Uh, okay, I will uh, paste the latitude and longitude. Uh, I try, I'll try. Yeah. Uh, and why don't you paste yours? And if there's maybe one other person or two other people, if you want to paste a lot long, I'll show you one other very neat thing that you can do with the tool. Perfect. In, right, let's in, look. The, in the document, I only uh, took some uh, screenshots just to, to see the, 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 those changes, those cyclic changes. All right, so this is something I just added. I'm glad it's working. Um, but down in this load button, if you either have an Earth Engine asset, and we can talk about what that means, essentially a file that you've uploaded to Earth Engine yourself and lives on your own Earth Engine account, you can add a path. Or if you just put a set of coordinates, um, longitude, then latitude order, just like they are in the chart, um, the uh, the tool should zoom you to that location and you'll see a red point. And now if we want to see the time series that Maria was looking at, we can click and hopefully that blue dot will show up right near the red one. Um, and oh, if we look at, so do you have a, a particular sensor that you were looking at? Were you looking at Sentinel-2 or Landsat? Sorry, I use Landsat. Nice. All right. Let me pull up. Let's see even Landsat 5 so we get a nice long time series. But yeah, so if you um, 
if you're like me and you want to look at the data before you start fitting algorithms and doing any more complicated analysis, I think this is a great way to get started. Um, there we go. So we've got a time series, I'm seeing some seasonal patterns there. We're kind of in the middle of the reservoir, but I imagine there's some other points you could check around um, if there's any um, kind of shoreline changes or like you're saying changes in the tributaries. Uh, but part of the reason I built this tool is exactly what we're doing here. Just spend some time looking at the data, examining points. If you want to pull the actual data, when you download that CSV, you have the real reflectance values. Um, and if you want to get back to the points, you can save that lat long and be able to kind of recreate where you were and share it with others. So thank you so much for sharing me. It's a super interesting example and hopefully everyone else found some things uh, that were interesting to them. Um, I should also say this tool is out there and hosted, so feel free to continue using it after today. So I use it all the time, both for exploratory work on my own and for courses like this. So um, welcome to continue using it, and I'm always all ears on new features. The lat long was something that just got added recently, as someone suggested. So yeah. All right, well, let's get back to our presentation here and kind of moving along. So again, starting with looking at the data before we do um, more complicated things. Oh, and we've got a Slido. So why don't we take a minute and um, let me know here what else you looked at. So Maria looked at a reservoir. Did you find abrupt changes, gradual changes? Did you look at fires, urbanization? Um, what were the different processes that you looked at? And let's take a minute until about 29 um, and get some answers in here. Nice, hydro period's a good one. Especially when you get dramatic changes in water and non-water, those show up pretty dramatically um, in the spectral signatures. Oh wow, replacements of mangroves by infrastructures are going out toward the coast. All sorts of things. Wildfires, again, those big traumatic changes tend to show up really clearly. Plantations, so there you might want to use something like the phenology signal to understand um, is it a conifer, evergreen plantation, or something with a more deciduous cycle, start thinking about what's being planted. Urban growth, again, those signals are pretty dramatic when you're converting things from vegetated to built. Oh, bridge construction, neat. I don't know that I've ever looked at a bridge being constructed. Yes, and a good point uh, to the RLC. Um, I was kind of keeping it local. I tend to work um, kind of in, in the same place that I live and uh, where my research is based. But this app and the image collections uh, that are in it are all global. So you can zoom around anywhere in the world um, and, uh, and get some data. Um, algal blooms. I learned recently a bit more about surface reflectance corrections over water. Uh, Landsat is now working on a special new product that applies a different surface reflectance correction that's supposed to be better suited for aquatic environments. So if you're someone interested in offshore processes, stay tuned. Hopefully the Landsat data will be more usable for that in the future. Um, and maybe even a good reason to put in some other sensors as well. I know there's lots of ocean specific uh, sensors out there. Awesome. Let folks finish up typing. Neat. Again, good to see all the diversity of things that folks are looking at. Um, and yeah, 
definitely keep exploring, uh, keep looking for these processes and keep in your mind as we're moving into the next section, uh, what the shapes of those curves were going back to that diagram I showed where they kind of step functions. Was it the cyclic types of change? Were there kind of distinct disturbance recovery patterns? And I got one more answer in here and then we're gonna move on just to keep to time when I got through uh, at least the next section before, before the break. And for those who are still typing, the poll might go inactive. I'm sorry about that, but I'm going to let you finish up and then we'll move on. All right. Ah, and I also should mention the app does have a Q&A section in it. Um, I don't know if you're able to see my phone, but uh, next to the polls. So I've been finding it easy to keep up on questions in chat, uh, but we'll also have a couple slides like this where there are questions there. So you can feel free to either put your questions in chat or into the Slido app and we can address them either way. But name of the app is, it's the Earth Engine, or sorry, the Earth Observation EO Time Machine, um, and it's embedded in that link there. So now we've looked at a bunch of changes. I'm sure you're wondering, right? Like we can't go through and label all of these by hand. So a big push uh, since these records have become more readily available has been automating the process of change detection. And historically you might do something as simple as take two images from similar times of year for the same place at kind of disparate points in time. So maybe one from, you know, back in the beginning of the Landsat record and one more recent and you'd subtract them. You'd say the difference in spectral is related to differences in the ground condition. But now that we have access to more complete time series per pixel, we've got a lot more options in terms of change detection. And one of the big developments are kind of big categories of these types of algorithms are called temporal segmentation algorithms. And as I mentioned earlier, today we're going to talk mostly about the land trender and CCDC approaches. So that's um, the continuous change detection and classification um, and land trender. And I'll get into a bit more about how they're different. Um, but there are other methods out there you may have heard of. There's one called BFAST, uh, exponentially weighted moving average change detection, it's Iwamaxity, if you say the acronym out. Um, and a lot of these, or all of the ones I just mentioned, are available in Earth Engine as algorithms. Um, so the two I'm talking about today are just the ones I'm most familiar with, but there are more out there. So if you haven't heard of temporal segmentation specifically before, you may have heard of something uh, called semantic segmentation. So here's a couple of examples of semantic segmentation, very big in computer vision, on camera imagery. And what this is accomplishing is, you can see in the picture of the horse, we're classifying background versus horse, or in the lower picture, trees versus road. More or less, we are grouping pixels from the imagery into continuous objects and giving those objects one grouped label. And in an Earth observation context, this might look something like this. So this is an object-based image analysis, OBIA. So you can see in the top image here, those blue borders are defining the boundary of spatial objects. You can see the kind of a park in here, the edges of roads. Um, and then when labels are applied, those distinct objects are all grouped into the same thing, the same label. In temporal segmentation, we are grouping things in terms of not space, so clusters of pixels, but time. And I've got another slide out here just to give me, again, a bit of context on where we're coming from. How familiar are y'all with temporal segmentations? Have you heard of these before? You know, use them in practice or if just never use them, um, you know, just coming at this new for the first time. All right, so let's let the results come in. I don't want to spend too long on this one, so get a few responses. Okay, so it sounds like most folks have not done this before, or have done maybe a little bit of exploration, much smaller portion of people have used in practice. Great. So I think a lot of this from what I'm seeing is going to be new information for most. Um, 
and that is totally good. We're going to see a bunch of examples, um, and then we're going to have an opportunity to experiment again with an app and some pixels. And if you're interested in continuing on with this, again, these algorithms are available in Earth Engine. They're available um, in other places and packages as well. So um, lots of opportunities to continue with this if it's something that you want to try in your own work. So. Um, I'm going to skip that question just in the interest of time, but to kind of give you a biggest picture overview of CCDC and LAM Trender. If we start with a time series of all Landsat observations, in this case, giving us a nice long time series, so instead of broken by individual satellite like they were in the app, this is if we harmonize the whole record from Landsat 5 all the way through. I think this one has Landsat 8, 9 hadn't been launched yet. Um, but each of these black points is an observation, just like the colored points in the tool. And CCDC is a uh, segmentation algorithm that uses a harmonic model. So this squiggly line is simply under the hood a uh, linear model. So there's a straight line segment. And on top of that, there's harmonic terms. And so there's a sine and a cosine pair um, that's part of the regression fit. And what CCDC does is it starts at the beginning of the time series and it starts trying to fit this harmonic model with these different um, harmonic coefficients. It is fitting looking forward. So it takes a year of data, it adds uh, you know, a few more observations, and then it refits the model. And as it's looking forward, it's saying, well, if I kept extrapolating that line further out, and I'm not sure if folks can see my cursor here, but if you were to keep moving that line forward and projecting it in time, are the new observations in the time series substantially different from the curve. And so right in where this first dotted line is, suddenly we have this change and the new observations are deviating quite a bit. We've got a huge um, residual there. And so if CCDC sees at least some number of, and this is a user-defined parameter, typically we say five to seven observations are very different than the expected value based on the fitted curve, it puts a break in. And these breaks are discontinuous. So it's a true step function. The end of one segment doesn't join to the beginning of the next. So we get this abrupt break, and then a new segment begins to fit. And if we think back to that picture from the semantic segmentation or the object-based analysis, that segment in time becomes our object. And if you were to try and build a land cover classification, say, off of these CCDC segments, you would assign one label to the entire um, entire segment here. So we would have three different cover types or three different trajectories here um, with two distinct change events or breaks in the CCDC perspective. Um, Land Trender, on the other hand, takes the original time series, so going back to the uh, plot here with all of the observations, and for each year in the time series, we generate a composite. So we take uh, most often the metoid, which is a multivariate median um, for a growing season. So we say, instead of trying to actually model the phenology, have that harmonic term in there, what if we just take the greenest observation or the kind of most uh, like central tendency summer value uh, for the northern hemisphere. Uh, you would have to flip the dates for the southern hemisphere, but you can take the kind of average summer value and track that through time. And so again, instead of having this model that's sensitive to phenology, we can treat each of these segments like a straight line. And unlike CCDC, that's forward looking, it's adding observations as it goes, Land Trender takes the whole time series of these annual values and it tries to fit, starts with a single line segment and it says, oh, well, there's still a lot of error in there. If I drew one line across, there's some points where there's, um, there's a lot of deviation from that line. So what if I split it into two lines? 
well, if I maybe had the first big segment here and then a second, well, we still have a big error. So it continues to add these vertices as opposed to breaks like in CCDC until you get a trajectory. And so the key points are we've got, instead of a harmonic, we've got a linear fit, we've got a trajectory. So instead of having a step function that discontinuity um, gap between the ends of the segments like we do in CCDC, we get a continuous line and the white circles are called vertices. So they're points of inflection. They're when the line segment changed its rate. And we're looking at the entire time series at once when we're processing, as opposed to kind of adding observations as we go and looking for deviations. So both of these approaches give us observations that are now grouped due to their similarity through time. We can think about the breaks in CCDC or the vertices in land trender as change events, but hopefully you're getting a sense even just looking at these figures that the two different processes give us um, different information and are suitable for different use cases. So I had recommended as a reading um, in the uh, hopefully emails that went out, um, I recently published a paper with uh, some of the uh, Robert Kennedy who wrote the original land trender algorithm, as well as some folks, Paolo Arvelo and uh, Eric Bullock who do a lot of work with CCDC and Noel Gorlick who works on Earth Engine and did both of the implementations. Um, with Shikon Young. Uh, so they all helped put together this paper that's supposed to help walk through some examples and some use cases. If you're interested in these, I highly recommend, not just because it's my own paper, but because it was specifically written to give a good introduction to folks who are not already familiar with these algorithms. Um, but to show a few more examples here in our 15 minutes before the break, um, we can see in this series, we have uh, three different uh, spectral indices. So the top row is all tasseled cap wetness. The middle row is the normalized burn ratio and the bottom row is NDVI. If you're not as familiar, just important thing is that it's three different spectral uh, measures. And CCDC, uh, another feature of it is that it fits across multiple bands, so it can account for multiple spectral indices or bands when it's performing break detection. So we get slightly different um, curves depending on the observations themselves, but the important thing is the dotted lines all line up. We get the same set of breaks because we're detecting those breaks across the same uh, bands. Land Trender, on the other hand, is a univariate uh, algorithm. So it is only looking at one band at a time when it's performing change detection. That means it runs nice and quickly because it doesn't have to combine tests across different bands, but it also means that you can get different results depending on what band or index you use for your monitoring. So you can see here we've got different numbers of vertices uh, depending on which of the bands we used for change detection. And Trender does have a nice feature where you can use those vertices and, and um, points of inflection across multiple bands when you go to do some sort of classification or you want to use other bands. Um, but the important thing is when you're performing change detection with Land Trender, you pick one band to detect change on. When you're performing change detection with CCDC, you are picking a set of bands and you're using the multispectral information, which adds a little bit more overhead to the process, uh, but it also kind of makes it more robust and is able to use more of that multispectral information. I'm going to move through these quickly, but I hope we'll have some time for questions if there are things people are still unclear on. Um, as I mentioned in the first slide, Land Trender works on annual composites, so you have to pick a range of dates over which to pick your one best value, your median or your mean, uh, whatever compositing technique you want to use. And so in both of these examples, there's one on the left from um, Maine in the northeastern United States, and there's one from Egypt, but you can see, depending on whether I picked, you know, a uh, June through uh, September growing season composite, just varying the dates, 10 days or so, could change the results 
quite a bit. Like in this case, I got a vertex here, uh, but not in the uh, second row there um, you if you pick uh, you know later in the growing season again you'll get different results depending on which dates you want to make the composite over the Egypt example shows this even more dramatically uh, depending on which months you choose you may get everything from you know three or four different vertices all the way to the bottom panel uh, the last one for land trender uh, where you're getting just one straight line and CCDC on the other hand, you're using all of the data. There is only one potential outcome given all available observations. You don't have to be as prescriptive in this is the period I specifically want to use for monitoring. This is the temporally consistent season of the year, um, but it's also sensitive to outliers. So instead of using a median or composite to reduce your data set to one nice smooth annual value, you now have a lot more noise. So if you've got clouds and shadows and other outliers, CCDC, uh, needs to be robust to those. And it does use a lasso uh, regression algorithm, which makes it um, less sensitive, but cloud masking and uh, that sort of thing become even more important with CCDC because we're not doing some sort of filtering or median compositing first. I think this is the last example, but uh, both algorithms are also sensitive to when your uh, you're trying to fit your segments over. And so uh, both of these examples, we're looking at the full time series from 1985 to 2020 versus a subset from 2000 to 2020. And you can see, especially in that CCDC example, the first segment has a very different slope. It's the middle segment in the top and the first in the bottom. Um, and so you can get a very different answer depending on what length of the time series you put in. And I think as these algorithms become more readily available on cloud-based platforms, there's a lot of room for ensembling and new types of uncertainty analysis, how we combine observations across multiple views of the data. Do we subset them in different ways? Uh, do you run across different bands? I've done a lot of that with Land Trender, um, but there's many answers to the segmentation problem, just like you might question where to place an edge between a forest and a road in a uh, spatial segmentation. Oh, and I think this is actually the last example. So here, if you've got a nonlinear pattern, so this is especially evident in the uh, figure to the right, but if you've got kind of a curved shape, you can see CCDC wants to just make that one straight line. Land Trender is trying to fit many small segments to capture what's really a nonlinear shape. So another challenge with these uh, two in particular temporal segmentation algorithms, if they're based on linear fits, you're going to be limited to straight lines, whether they've got harmonics on top of them or not. And as we probably know from looking at a lot of examples, uh, <laughs> nature is not always uh, giving us nice, neat linear patterns when change is occurring. So these are, um, they're generalizations, their models, and they do have limits in terms of um, being able to fit more complex shapes. Uh, these are in the slide deck for reference. Um, you're going to see these in the tool that we're looking at next, but each of the algorithms has their own set of knobs you can turn. I won't go into too much detail in the interest of time, but for uh, Land Trender, some of the important things, you've got to specify uh, which time series, so which bands you want to run your analysis on. The original paper tried a couple different spectral indices. Uh, the paper uh, in 2018 from Kennedy et al. that discusses the Earth Engine implementation focused on NBR as a good uh, index. Um, you have to specify how many segments, so there's a constraint on how many uh, pieces one expects there to be in a time series, and all of these default values are good starting points, though definitely worth, if you're looking at a longer time series, you might want more max segments. Um, and lots of other knobs, uh, whether or not you want to allow for things to recover very quickly, um, some thresholds on change, how many observations you need. So there's a bunch of different knobs, again, you can turn. And I would recommend, if you're going to use these algorithms, using some visualization tools like the one we'll share today to kind of get a sense of how this works for some specific examples. 
This Valerie? is yes. There is a question for you in the chat. Um, someone, Andres, is asking, um, what technique can you recommend to detect outliers and then to impute uh, NA values into time series? Okay, um, so for, um, this is probably more relevant in the land trender context. So if you're missing an entire year of data, um, the algorithm actually takes care of that for you. So if you're if you have an NA in your time series because I want to make an annual composite and I have no data for 1992 for whatever reason, um, the algorithm will fit through that. So it is robust in the land trender case. Um, for CCDC, uh, it's more in terms of the um, harmonic fit. So if you have missed clouds and shadows in that time series, uh, we're using a WASO regression. So it it is it shrinks your harmonic coefficient so they don't go way out of whack if you've got a um, if you've got a big outlier in there. If you're going all the way back to, okay, uh, if you're going back to other cleaning, um, so again, it's going to depend on the algorithm, uh, existing cloud masks uh, for each of the sensors. It'll depend on which you're using. Landsat has F mask, uh, tends to work fairly well using the combination of the thermal band and object matching. So just applying the default F mask usually gets you pretty far. And CCDC was developed to work um, in conjunction with the Landsat time series. Landtrender as well, but Landtrender has that added benefit of making a composite. So you get a chance to take a median. So if you've got really dark things and really bright things, it's gonna find the central value before you fit the time series. So even less sensitive. If you wanna use other algorithms, um, BFAST is more akin to CCDC. It uses harmonic seasonal terms in addition to um, and to like long-term trends and uh, step functions. Um, but the data cleaning is going to be sensor dependent and uh, that gets into the whole other set of um, yeah, cloud shadow and other QA approaches. Yep. I hope that's somewhat helpful. It's, yeah, it's hard. It's like, they're all different. Um, and I'll, I will say Sentinel-2 is perhaps the most challenging here. It's, uh, we've got S2 Cloudless is now available in Earth Engine, which does an amazing job mostly with the clouds, but it doesn't take care of the cloud shadows. And there are some custom solutions for dealing with that. Um, but if you're working globally, you're going to be a little bit stuck with what's kind of readily available off the shelf. If you're doing your own study area, I would also say if you're finding data points that are just this image is bad and not flagged as bad, you can also always remove things manually by date um, and things like the tool we were playing with earlier are good for finding some of those outliers and um, bad data points. For, for gap filling, uh, when you speak about variables, not, not really reflectance per se, but variables like LST or NDVI, there are different, like even HANS, which is also based on harmonics, you can use HANS to like fill the gaps. Uh, and then patch back with the original time series. Uh, and it's true that it overshoots, so a good improvement would be to use this lasso regression then. Um, and then for LST, we have used uh, weighted linear regression uh, to fill the temporal gaps, and then splines to fill the remaining spatial gaps. But it's like, like a whole different world and a whole piece of work in itself. Uh, it's, it's not trivial at all. Yeah, yeah, we're just scratching the surface and hopefully giving you um, a good sense of what options might be and it'll be very, yeah, what you're, what sensors you're using, what um, inputs and whether you need to you know, fill gaps spatially versus temporally. Also seeing a question, CCDC and a regular frequency. CCDC is typically run with observations at their native frequency. Um, there's some work by the USGS in particular, and it's called out in the paper, where they've done some dynamic um, 
adapting, like uh, when you have Landsat 7 come online, when 5 was in operation, we now doubled the observation frequency, two sensors instead of one. If you look for change twice as often, you will find it more frequently. I won't necessarily say twice as often, but they were finding that you got a greater amount of detected change when you had two sensors as opposed to one. So CCDC, there are ways to adapt it and account for irregular frequency, but it is typically run on the observations at the frequency that you have them at. Um, and uh, in terms of harmonizing data sets, uh, another place where we could have a whole lecture on harmonization, um, there are, uh, NASA has an effort to harmonize Landsat and Sentinel, so that's the HLS products. Um, and those are trying to take Sentinel data and make it look like Landsat. There's also ESA now has an effort uh, called Sentu-like that I recently learned about, where they're trying to make um, they're trying to make Landsat data look like Sentinels. So they're doing super resolution to get finer pixel sizes. There's all sorts of other efforts on um, like modus and downsampling. So yeah all sorts of different uh, methodologies none available immediately off the shelf like if you're working in earth engine you have the raw sensors and none of those harmonized data sets are in there yet um, but i would say starting points are products that are already being offered so if you can get them um, from either isa or nasa or i'm not aware of um, other efforts but i'm sure there are more out there for the broader suite of sensors um, and then uh, there are, you know, all sorts of interesting ideas, like with, you can use regression to match things. Um, there are a whole lot of different uh, approaches, like I said, could probably be its own, own lecture, but um, yes, thank you. The link in the chat to the HLS products, but um, again, you can start combining them, but that's its own area of research with all its own pitfalls and, um, and challenges. All right, great questions. And yeah, please feel free to jump in if I can't um, see yep. while I'm there talking. One, there is one more question here and then. Yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> Valerie, thank you very much yes. for the presentation. I find it really interesting and, and fun actually. I like the interactive tools you presented. So it was very, very nice. Um, I have been working with time series, with snow, seasonal snow time series in Google Earth Engine, but I actually plotted the time series with some smoothing and, um, and modifications for the Sentinel-1 collection, and then I exported it to work it with R. So I find it really interesting what you're presenting. But I have some questions related to um, the uh, if, if you have worked with a cyclic time series where like the uh, through the years it's the same um, uh, behavior of the time series and for example with the CC, CCDC algorithm if it um, detects the same segments in all of the years and I think you mentioned that you can label the segments and if uh, if you label, for example, in the first year, you can, uh, it automatically uh, relates the segments to the other years. And another question would be if you can choose the number of segments you want to be detected in time series. I don't know if you said it. I, ah, great questions. And so I'm going to go back to a figure just so we have an example to look at. And I think this one will do. So for CCDC, yes, when you are just automating the process of fitting the segments, you are going across years. And so you can imagine, I wish I had put an animation in here. Um, it's kind of fitting iteratively. It's adding things. So it starts at the beginning and then it adds observations and fits. So as you go through the years, you are modifying and adjusting the curve until you hit an end point, until you hit a break. And so all of the observations um, in a single segment are assigned to the parameters of that segment. And if you were to do classification, what's usually done is either you take the actual harmonic regression coefficients. So you take the slope and the intercept and sine and cosine coefficients, and you use those as inputs to a classifier. So then this whole first segment gets one label. Um, 
Alternatively, sometimes people predict an image. So they say, okay, use this curve and predict the value at June 1st of every year or December 1st of every year. Um, and you get a, a predicted image that isn't a real data point. It's, it's just what the curve would have predicted um, from that, that fitted signal. And so all of them are linked together. And that's why I think it's helpful to think of these the way we think of semantic segmentation. It's like, we know that that horse in the, the picture back here has all sorts of, um, of detail. Like he's got a tail and he's got spots, but it's all the big pink horse segment when we go to assign a label. Very much the same with the temporal segmentation approaches. We are gonna get a single label for each segment. Um, and in terms of defining the number of segments, Landtrender gives you an option to say the maximum. You say don't don't make more than six or more than eight segments. Um, but the actual number ends up being determined by a goodness of fit test. So after Landtrender has kind of determined it's I would fit all of these segments to represent this trajectory while minimizing error, it goes back and it says, well, what if I merged these segments and uses an F test to say, okay, Okay, well, is it, do I get an improvement in um, the explanatory power of the segments by having more versus a trade off with the parsimony? So, if I have fewer, can I get away with fewer segments and not really hurt my error too much? And so, there's a balancing act with Land Trender. Um, I will show you an approach. Uh, the next section we're going to go into is kind of a uh, more generic uh, anomaly detection, and that you can be a little more prescriptive in the number of segments and uh, what you are, are fitting with them. But yeah, I hope that that gets it.